Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. George, and uh, I want to start by thanking uh, Philip Fortier and uh, the Defeat MSA Alliance for uh, inviting me to speak at this symposium. Uh, it's actually evening here, not morning, but uh, so if I look a little uh, <clears throat> worse for wear, that's why. Uh, I'm going to talk to you, I believe I'm the second speaker uh, following uh, Tony Lang who told you about uh, diagnosis and uh, background of multiple system atrophy. And the later speakers are going to tell you all the exciting things that are going on for research and treatment. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I have this uh, pivot in the middle to remind you that uh, there is treatment. All too often I get patients coming into my office and saying, I was told I have multiple system atrophy and there's no treatment for it, so just go home. So uh, I'm going to tell you there is treatment for multiple system atrophy. There's no cure, there's no disease modifying treatment yet, but there's a lot of ongoing research. And here on the slide, it mentions uh, interrupting alpha-synuclein misfolding, prevention of protein aggregation, clearing protein aggregates, and there are a number of other types of exciting research that hopefully will lead us to uh, some sort of cure, or at least a d disease modifying treatment that will slow the progression. Uh, but this slide, which I borrowed from somebody else, shows you a sort of summary of the progression of multiple system atrophy. And you see all these different symptoms popping up as you go from left to right with the uh, diagnosis and progression of the disease. And what we can do now is treat the symptoms. And there's symptomatic treatment for Parkinsonism, for cerebellar dysfunction, for orthostatic hypotension, which is key, for other types of autonomic dysfunction, and for swallowing. Now, one thing, uh, and you probably heard a bit about this uh, in the previous talk, is uh, multiple system atrophy does not respond as well to levodopa as Parkinson's disease does. However, <clears throat> it's important to realize it does respond. And here's uh, two different studies that uh, pointed out that uh, around half the patients had a substantive response to levodopa, and it tended to last for about three and a half years. So uh, you do want to uh, remember that levodopa can help, you do have to use really large doses. So generally we gradually increase up to 1,000 milligrams divided into uh, four doses throughout the day before deciding that it's not effective. And again, you might be in that half that uh, doesn't have response. Uh, but if you do get a response, you can go even higher than that. So these are very high doses compared to what we use for Parkinson's disease. Um, but nonetheless, if it's effective and it's tolerated, uh, it can be done. If it's not effective, you need to taper it very slowly. Or if you've had an effect and you're beginning to lose it uh, or you've lost it, then it has to be tapered quite slowly. It's important to remember that it may worsen some of the other symptoms like orthostatic hypotension. Usually other dopaminergic agents are not tolerated at high enough doses to really be affected, but there are exceptions to this and it depends on how you respond to the levodopa. And if you get some of the side effects of uh, excess movement from levodopa, then you may be able to use one of the many other uh, Parkinson's drugs. One other important uh, Parkinson's drug is amantadine. There have been a number of different studies with different uh, results looking at oral doses of amantadine as an anti-Parkinsonian agent in MSA patients. Most of these were done before the uh, unified MSA rating scale was available and used the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, which may overlook some benefit. And one thing that uh, fairly recently, there have been two open label studies using intravenous amantadine, uh, where people showed improvement, particularly in walking. And it, the, one of the studies was done in MSAP, Parkinsonian predominant patients. 
and use the uh, unified MSA rating scale. The other one was done in MSAC patients and used the international cerebellar ataxia rating scale. Um, but both showed some response. And this may be because the drug was given intravenously, but also these are using measures that weren't done with oral uh, drugs in the past. So there may be some newer evidence that uh, amantadine can be useful. In practice, it turns out that uh, in some people it does seem to be beneficial and we try it and see if we can get a benefit. Cerebellar ataxia is harder to treat than Parkinson's. Um, and physical therapy for balance and use of walking aids like uh, <clears throat> quad canes and rolling walkers uh, is very important actually in both the MSAC and MSAP. Uh, but there are some medications that can help Clonazepam is often used. It reduces overshoot uh, if you get upper limb dysmetria and you're reaching for things and the targeting is off. It can reduce some of the tendency to uh, shoot past what you're reaching for. And it can also help to reduce tremor and myoclonus uh, if they occur. Another interesting drug is Riluzol. It was developed originally to be used in Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but it's currently thought to slow progression of cerebellar dysfunction in many cerebellar diseases. It was not effective in a large multicenter randomized double blind trial uh, <clears throat> looking specifically at multiple system atrophy patients and also uh, some cortical basilar degenerate patients and progressive supranuclear palsy patients. The primary endpoint of that uh, study, though, was survival because this drug helps people with Lou Gehrig's to live a little bit longer. And the secondary endpoints were, again, measures of Parkinsonism. It did not use the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, nor did it use the unified uh, MSA rating scale. Um, and most of the patients were in fairly advanced stages of disease. So it was an excellent trial for what it was looking at, which is, is this a neuroprotective agent that would slow disease progression and uh, <clears throat> allow people to live longer with the disease, but it was not a terribly good trial for detecting whether there might be some modification of cerebellar dysfunction. So hopefully that will be uh, revisited as to whether it could improve uh, quality of life in patients with a lot of cerebellar dysfunction. Now, the big thing, of course, is orthostatic hypotension symptoms. Orthostatic hypotension is really a hallmark of multiple systems atrophy. And it's important to remember that it causes a lot of different symptoms. People often focus on the dizziness and lightheadedness uh, and presyncope, which is feeling like you're about to faint, syncope, when you do faint, um, that uh, are widely recognized as being symptoms of orthostatic hypotension. But you have to remember mild orthostatic hypotension can lead to difficulty concentrating, headache, uh, difficulty with just uh, thought processes. It can affect your lungs and make you short of breath. It can affect your heart and give you chest pain. It can affect your retina and give you sort of blurry vision. And it can affect muscles, particularly in your shoulders and back. So people often get this sort of aching pain in their back in a coat hanger distribution. And then there are a variety of other really nonspecific symptoms. So you have to be aware of what the symptoms of orthostatic hypotension are uh, that you're trying to treat. Now, we always start with non-pharmacologic measures to treat orthostatic hypotension. Uh, gradual staged movements to change position. You get up slowly, don't start walking right away. Very important for maintaining balance with orthostatic hypotension. Also increasing salt and fluid intake is very helpful. And we like to have people elevate the head of their bed. Really, you'd like to tilt the entire bed so that the head is higher than the feet, 
It doesn't have to be very much of a tilt. And this, of course, minimizes supine hypertension, where your blood pressure tends to go high when you're lying down, just the way it goes low when you're standing up. But uh, also, not being completely flat overnight helps maintain some of the vascular tone that tightens up the blood vessels and helps keep the blood pressure from dropping. So the orthostatic hypotension in the morning won't be quite as bad as if you're lying totally flat. We do other things to remove aggravating factors. You avoid really large meals, which redirect a lot of your blood flow to the gut and can make you have more orthostatic hypotension symptoms. Uh, you can avoid excessive caffeine use. A little caffeine actually helps hold the blood pressure up. A lot of caffeine can act as a diuretic and lose some of the fluid that you want. You avoid hot baths and beware of warm weather where there's more blood flow to the surface and therefore less blood flow to the rest of the body and can make the orthostatic hypotension symptoms worse. And then also we like to use compression stockings and an abdominal binder to try and keep up that vascular tone, uh, particularly in the lower extremities and lower abdomen so that the blood pressure is less inclined to drop. So here I always like this slide, water is important and everybody drinks bottled water these days. And this guy's looking at this display with mineral water, spring water, sparkling water, well water, and then as I always suspect, bottled tap water, and finally back water and jerk water. But it doesn't matter what kind of water you like to drink, you need to take in lots of fluids to help combat the orthostatic hypotension. Now, there are a variety of medications that we use for orthostatic hypotension, and I believe there's a new trial going on for a new drug. Uh, mostly, we ring the changes on the three on the left side of the slide. Fludocortisone, or Florinef, is a drug that makes your body hang on to salt and water, so it can help expand the volume and act against the orthostatic hypotension. This is sort of a long duration effect because once you've got the fluid and water in, it doesn't leave immediately if you stop taking the drug. Uh, it does tend to leave when you lie down at night, which can cause more urination at night. Uh, you also have to be careful with it uh, because it can lead to congestive heart failure in people who are prone to uh, that problem from their heart. So. Uh, the other approach, rather than expanding the volume, is to tighten up the blood vessels. The orthostatic hypertension occurs, of course, because when you get upright, normally the uh, blood vessels tighten up and uh, keep the blood from pooling and expanding the blood vessels in the lower part of the body, leading to the uh, drop in blood pressure and perfusion in the upper part of the body. So both midodrine and droxidopa, known as proamatine and Northera, can help to tighten up the blood vessels. And they are shorter acting drugs than uh, <clears throat> the uh, effects of the fludrocortisone. The uh, droxidopa has the advantage that it is converted to norepinephrine so your body releases norepinephrine into the circulation to tighten up the blood vessels and create that tone. This helps the uh, body release more norepinephrine, similar to the way levodopa helps your brain make more uh, um, dopamine. So in that respect, it really enhances the natural reflex to tighten up the blood vessels as opposed to the midodrine which simply tight, gets in there and tightens up the blood vessels. But both can work, and both can give you more action during the day than at night. Um, and uh, they can even be combined as, if necessary. Another drug that's sometimes used is peridostigmine, known as mestinon. This also enhances that reflex by acting further upstream stream in the reflex arc. Um, it tends to have a very mild effect, but sometimes is helpful. It has more problems with side effects than some of the other drugs. And then as we get more extreme, desmopressin or DDAVP, and it has several other names, 
is an antidiuretic hormone. So it also makes your body hang on to fluid. It's uh, again, that longer duration action of more fluid, but it's a more powerful effect than the fluidocortisone. And that is sometimes helpful. And then octreotide is another uh, hormone acting type of agent. And it helps to redirect the blood flow away from the gut uh, the way it naturally goes to the gut after a meal. And so that helps to provide more volume for sustaining the blood pressure throughout the rest of the body. Um, so these drugs are uh, all very often used in different uh, combinations and often in conjunction with the non-drug measures like the uh, support stockings and the abdominal binder can be quite effective in maintaining the blood pressure and avoiding orthostatic hypotension symptoms. Now I mentioned when you lie down, you can get supine hypertension where the blood pressure goes up and it's important to monitor people for elevated supine blood pressure and avoid lying down during the day when you're taking the medications that help keep your blood pressure up. Uh, you may want to rest in a somewhat reclined position, but keep your feet down and your head up uh, during the day. And as mentioned before, when you lie down at night and you're more flat, you want to elevate the head of the bed relative to the feet. Sometimes it's necessary to use uh, antihypertension drugs to keep the blood pressure down at night. Um, and we can use short acting and reversible drugs. One trick is to use nitro paste that's often used in cardiac patients. It has uh, two advantages. One, you can regulate the uh, amount of drug effect by how much paste you apply and you can wipe it off and get a fairly quick reversal. Also, captopril is often used because it's a relatively short acting medication. And there are other variations. Uh, you do have to be alert to the fact that if you have supine hypertension and take a drug to lower your blood pressure, but then have to get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom, you may have uh, more problems with orthostasis at night again. Another area that the autonomic nervous system uh, is important in is gut motility. And this can lead to constipation, which can be a real problem in many patients with multiple system atrophy. Um, and again, regular activity and drinking plenty of water, just as uh, water and fluids helps the orthostatic hypotension, it helps to uh, prevent constipation. And with it, we like to use an osmotic laxative. Uh, there are several uh, commonly used uh, Miralax and Glycolax. Uh, you, our brand names for polyethylene glycol, and you can get them over the counter. You can also get milk of magnesia over the counter. Lactulose actually needs a prescription. All of these simply pass through the gut and draw more fluid in to keep the stool soft as it passes through. And because of that, you want to try and take some of these every day. So it's always passing through the gut and bringing more fluid in so that at no place along the passage uh, does the stool start to, to get more solid and hard. Um, you can adjust the doses needed to keep the stool nice and soft, but not loose and runny. Um, sometimes people need to use a bulking agent like psyllium, which is Metamucil, uh, or some of the other fiber products, though many people can simply adjust their diet to get plenty of fiber. Um, and then stimulant laxatives, which are the first thing many people think of, and again, you can get many of them off the sh shelf, are things you really want to use sparingly and only when the stool is soft. These are medications that really cause your colon to, to spasm to try and force the stool out. And if the stool is hard and you're trying to force it out with a drug-induced effect, it can be unpleasant and it can be bad for your colon and lead to diverticulosis. It can cause problems with your rectum. And these are the well-known drugs, viscodal and senicides in particular, uh, in some of these brand names that are listed on the slide. 
So you can use them if the stool is soft and still not coming out, but you want to be very sparing with those kinds of medications. Another important issue is bladder issues in multiple system atrophy. And there are really two types of problems that people run into. Both have the symptoms of frequency, urgency, and incontinence. So you have to, when you gotta go, you gotta go urgency, frequency, you're running to the bathroom all the time, and incontinence because you got to go and you can't get to the bathroom in time. Uh, these can be symptoms of a spastic bladder, but they can also be symptoms of urinary retention, and they can also result from urinary tract infections. So with the urinary retention, incomplete bladder emptying results in rapid refilling to the max of the bladder and overflow incontinence. It just never gets very empty. It's always at least half full. And so you quickly get back up to the top and then the bladder spasms in response. Uh, the other possibility though, is you can develop a spastic bladder, which spasms even when there's very little urine in the bladder. So you get spasm and incontinence at low bladder volume. The symptoms are the same. So before trying to treat it, you need to check a post-void residual. Uh, the patient tries to empty their bladder and then typically an ultrasound is used to see how much uh, urine is still in the bladder. If the bladder is quite full after trying to empty, generally 100 cc's or more, then you need to use uh, approaches for trying to empty the bladder. If the bladder is plenty empty, uh, usually less than 50 cc's after you try and empty the bladder, then the bladder is probably spasming and you need to use medications that will relax spasms in the bladder. You don't want to use those medications in a bladder that's too full, however. And finally, you want to check a urinalysis for urinary tract infection. The irritation of the infection, even if you don't have other symptoms, and cause the bladder to spasm and cause the same frequency, urgency, and incontinence. Um, and blad bladder infections are much more common if the post-void residual is high. So if you determine that the bladder is spastic or hypertonic and there's a good emptying of the bladder, there are a number of different medications that are widely used. Um, oxybutynin is particularly uh, well known, but this drug in particular tends to cause cognitive problems and hallucinations in people with multiple system atrophy. And uh, so it's better to use some of the other drugs, uh, tolteridine, trospium, and the newer mirabagron are generally pretty well tolerated. Uh, Mirabagron actually increases blood pressure a bit, so it might help with orthostatic hypotension as well, but all of these can make constipation worse, so it's a balancing act. The other thing which gets uh, around any side effects from medications being taken systemically is to actually do botulinum toxin injections into bladder muscles to relax the bladder. Uh, and let it fill more completely. Um, this sounds unpleasant. It is a bit unpleasant. On the other hand, the injections typically last about three months, so uh, it's not too bad in that respect. If you have urinary retention, there are some medications that help to pass the urine. One that uh, is an older drug, terazosin, worsens hypotension. It's quite an effective anti-high blood pressure drug. So it should be avoided in people with multiple systems atrophy. But uh, tamsulosin can uh, work quite well um, in many patients. But if you can't get the muscles to relax enough to empty the bladder well, then intermittent catheterization becomes necessary. And in some cases, you can use a bladder stimulator uh, an electronic device that gets implanted to help activate the bladder muscles and push out the urine when necessary. Sleep disorders are another non-motor problem that comes up in multiple system atrophy a lot. Um, many people have insomnia for a variety of reasons and listed here are some of the uh, 
more common drugs that may be used. Uh, melatonin is always a favorite because this is a substance that your body makes when you're trying to go to sleep. So you're just edging in and giving a little boost to the um, normal mechanisms of sleep. Uh, and uh, trazodone uh, deserves mention as probably doing a better job of keeping people asleep uh, through the middle of the night than some of the other drugs. Um, but different things have to be tried for different patients. Another thing is that sleep apnea with periodic cessation of breathing in the night is not uncommon in people with multiple system atrophy. Often uh, people think of this as a problem that's chiefly in people who are overweight, but uh, because of the effects on the uh, muscle tone and the autonomic system, it can be a problem even in relatively thin people with multiple system atrophy. And usually the best approach is CPAP, a continuous positive airway pressure machine uh, at the bedside that uh, you have to get used to wearing a, a mask or nasal plugs and there are a variety of different ways if you get one that uh, you can't tolerate, you can't get to sleep with, you can try one of the other ones, but this will help to uh, keep the air flowing and keep you from stopping breathing in some cases, BiPAP, which uses two levels of airway pressure, is necessary. In extreme cases, there are surgeries to help keep the airway open. Another important sleep disorder in multiple system atrophy and all Parkinsonian diseases is rapid eye movement sleep behavioral syndrome. Uh, rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep is the sleep where you tend to dream and in the case of normal people, your movement motor system is largely turned off while you're dreaming. But this does not happen in the normal fashion in many people with Parkinsonian diseases and people begin to act out their dreams, which can sometimes be violent. This can actually lead to uh, dangerous situations of falling out of bed, uh, flailing around and injuring a bed partner, smashing a bedside lamp, or injuring yourself by uh, banging uh, your flailing limbs into to something. So we like to uh, find out about this and treat this whenever possible. Um, actually, melatonin can work for this, but it takes relatively high doses, much higher than the doses that people use just for insomnia. Um, there's also a drug called Rameltian, which acts on the same receptors as melatonin, uh, but a little more potently, and also clonazepam at bedtime. Uh, and usually uh, one of these three will be good to uh, control the uh, violent thrashing around and movement during dreaming sleep. So here we have this guy in a restaurant doing the universal uh, sign for choking, grabbing at his throat. It says, breathing, most of it's taken for granted until a problem develops. Um, but breathing and uh, swallowing in particular are affected by multiple system atrophy. So dysphagia or swallowing problems uh, occur uh, when the problems are mild, you can just be conscious of swallowing and use a soft diet, cut food into small pieces, drink fluids after solids to help wash the solids down. Sometimes people have to eat smaller, more frequent meals. As the swallowing muscles begin to have more problems, you often have to thicken liquids. There's special material for doing this called thicket, though there's some other things that can sometimes be used. And a speech therapist can teach a chin tuck technique and other swallowing techniques to help have safe swallowing. Um, it's often important to do a modified barium swallow, an x-ray swallowing movie to assess for aspiration, getting material into the lungs, since this can lead to uh, pneumonia. Because of this, uh, well, sometimes people choke while they're trying to, to eat and while they're swallowing and it's clear that there's a problem. Sometimes it's less clear and little bits of stuff are leaking into the lungs without causing choking during the meal. 
but frequently this leads to somebody having coughing after meals. And sometimes people will say, oh, I've developed this chronic cough, or a uh, life partner or caregiver will say, well, the patient has uh, developed a chronic cough, but if you look into it, that's not a chronic cough, it's a cough that occurs for a while after every meal because things have gotten in the lungs. And so then, uh, again, this can lead to pneumonia. And you want to be alert for signs of pneumonia, chest congestion, fever, cough, and change in sputum in people with multiple system atrophy because sometimes the swallowing problem is subtle enough that it just leads to pneumonia without people noticing any coughing or choking uh, between meals. You also want to monitor for weight loss, which can occur just because you're not swallowing enough to get enough nutrition in. And uh, again, you can use things like Onshore, Boost, uh, Sustacal, things to increase caloric intake uh, without having to swallow and consume as much food. It's always good to have someone supervising uh, meals once you start developing swallowing issues. And a caregiver should be educated in the use of the Heimlich maneuver, just in case there is a choking problem that you can't deal with on your own. Now, drooling is another factor that can come up in multiple system atrophy. And this is really related to the swallowing problem. You make saliva all the time in your mouth, and you, you have decreased spontaneous swallowing. You end up with saliva in your mouth. So trying to consciously swallow when you notice this can also help to make up for the lack of spontaneous swallowing that normally happens without any uh, effort on your part. And using a napkin or a tissue, just having something available to dab your mouth from time to time is often a better idea than uh, resorting to more extreme measures uh, unless things become more severe. There's also papaya extract that can be used, and it decreases uh, your production of saliva and makes it a little thicker, so you're less likely to drool. But then uh, once it becomes severe enough, we end up using medications to reduce saliva production and try and match the, the swallowing rate, though you have to be aware that these sorts of things can contribute to gum and dental disease if you decrease the saliva production too much. Most commonly, we use glycopyrrolate. Um, there are some other medications, one in a patch. Um, but all of these things have a tendency to side effects from systemic absorption. So you have to be very uh, careful with them. If that runs into a problem, botulinum toxin can be injected into the salivary glands and will decrease the saliva production, again, for many months at a time. And uh, this is a, a good solution with very little in the way of uh, systemic side effects. So with this tour through symptomatic treatment, uh, uh, <clears throat> I want to remind you that while we're working on disease modification and eventually having a cure, we can treat the symptoms in the meantime, and we need to do so. And so that's the end of my talk, but hopefully the research efforts on disease modification and an eventual cure are the beginning of the end of multiple systems atrophy. Thank you for your attention.